I love the pictures from Comedy Cellar, seeing it back open. That's great. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a big relief. Uh, you should stop by sometime and have some drinks and stuff. Totally. Uh, welcome you. to Live from America podcast. If you uh, recognize the voice, this is our good friend, a former FBI agent and U.S. Army officer and foreign policy analyst uh, for MSNBC, Clint Watts. And Woo-hoo! he's the author of the great book, Messing with the Enemy, Surviving in Social Media, uh, World of Hackers, Terrorists, Russians, and Fake News. <laughs> <laughs> well, applicable. And, and yes, good, for, good for search engine optimization as well. Absolutely. And he's here to uh, teach us everything. He's the man that knows Putin the most. So I'll leave it to Noam. Noam, go ahead. You have a million questions, I'm sure. Oh, what about Ukraine? Yeah. Well, yeah, I do have a lot of questions actually, but I don't I don't know where to begin. Usually you start. So okay, well let's let's start with, with something that I that I um somebody told me. I didn't actually see the tweet that I that I heard uh Clint tweeted that um you think we should maybe get involved in a no-fly zone or maybe even militarily uh in defending Ukraine, correct? Uh I'm so glad you asked this. So it was a framing tweet uh to get everybody riled up, as you might imagine. Um, it is called Messing with the Enemy. That's the book. So um, nice. the point The point is that I don't think people understand exactly what's going on in Russia or with Putin at this point. And so they're falling back into knee-jerk reaction. Every guy that was a Soviet academic scholar in the 80s has got all, all this figured out, and they're dead wrong. Putin is not the Soviet Union. We are not in a Soviet Union era right now. And Putin is way overextended himself by a lot. And he's going through total war. If you look at Mariupol, the, the city in the south today, again, they tried to do a humanitarian cordon essentially out of the town. They fired artillery directly into those people and killed them. And this is consistent. People are like, can you believe he did it? I'm like, yeah, he did it in Grozny, <laughs> Chechia. They did it in Aleppo, Syria. They've done this kind of stuff everywhere they go. I think separately, the other bigger issue is he was always going to invade. In the U.S. discussion, it was like it was all about us. <laughs> well, if we do this or if we don't, we say NATO will take Ukraine or we don't do this. And, you know, we're we have another aggressive. president. Yeah. Or if we have a different president, they'll handle it different. This is all because of Biden. No, no, no. He has said from for 20 years, I will during my time as the Russian leader, bring all Russian people left abroad at the end of the Cold War back under Russian control. Now, there's different forms of that. Sometimes it's like take over Crimea. Sometimes it's setting up puppet regimes, which he's tried in several places. And sometimes it's forcibly taking places back. And he also wants to unite people with land bridges. So people often forget there is a part of Russia that's on uh, the Baltic Sea. There is a part of Russia that's in uh, uh, Moldova, Guess where he's advancing today? Straight across. He's going to go into Moldova. He's going to connect that land bridge. He's going to take Odessa. He's going to unify the Russian people. So part of the reason that intelligence the U.S. kept releasing in the weeks before the invasion was so strong is because it was not a debate. Macron is running back and forth to Moscow. Oh, I'm going to work this out. Six hours later, he looks like a fool. Putin was always going to do this. And I think the issue is, is Putin's not going to win. And so... When he loses or he's losing, what will he do to make sure? Because what he's ultimately worried about is not about taking Ukraine. It's about his place in history. It's not about how many Russian soldiers he loses. It's about his place in history. And he wants to be seen as the Russian leader that retook and put the Kiev, the home of Rus, a thousand years ago, as the capital uh, of the Russian population. And you said he's going to lose. How, How do you think he's going to lose militarily? Yeah, he's overextended, and he's not going to be able to hold it. He may be able to do total warfare, but I actually put the tweet stream into a Washington Post op-ed, which came out on uh, Thursday night, which is we should also worry about it. The 30-day mark, if he's losing, what will happen in Moscow? Because I think the economic sanctions, I didn't expect it to be this heavy, this quick. I think the technological wall that's coming down um, in between Russia and the rest of the world is pretty devastating. The Russian people today are not the Soviets, and they've always had some sort of outside access to money and information, and that's that's going to have a shock effect in the you country. You think it's smart that they're going after the Russian billionaires as well? Wait, wait, no, wait, 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 not entirely. 
Um, when you say he's he was always going to do this, do, does that mean that it there was nothing we could have done? In, so, look, for instance, let's say we said when he was building up, we're, we're putting troops in there, and if, if you go in, we're going to fight you. Would he have done it then? He would have used it as a justification to evade then. He, so, he, and if so you he was, were in the Russian disinfo sphere right now, today's story this is a great one. Secret NATO laptop discovered brought back to Moscow, contents say NATO plan to invade summer 2022. That's what the Russian people are hearing today. So he was ready to go to war with the United States of America to do this, even though he yeah. knew he would lose? Yes. And so it, history is so important to the Russians that they're constantly rewriting it. So one of the reasons they're always changing Wikipedia is because they're trying to make their version of history. And he wants to sit at that mantle. And here's why I see this as well. We have tried several times to have what's called the Russian reset. Uh, uh, Bush, I think it was like 2003 or four, he was very committed to this idea, like, let's work with Putin and we'll kind of just settle this down because they saw him as an ally in the war on terror. That's really what it was about. Uh, in the 1990s, in Bosnia, units that I worked with, I didn't go to Bosnia, they did joint patrols with the Russians. And there were discussions at one point about, would we bring Russia into NATO to just create like, a peaceful environment, change NATO to not be anti-Russian, but make it a way that it's almost like a secondary UN where we have military deconfliction, we don't invade each other. Are we good with that? <laughs> no. Uh, 2008, Georgia. Look forward. Obama, McFall, who you see all the time, let's do a reset with Russia. No. So he's been very determined and very explicit in his own circles that the goal is to reestablish Russia and bring everybody home. And he said that for 15 to 20 years. I think we all thought because he lies so much and they use disinformation, like, nah, he's not that serious about it. It's like a nationalist thing you say at home, you know, like America first or something. It's not. Right, but, he, is, he, is he, but, but is he not Is he not rational? I mean, what I'm saying is that if he, he look, okay, my, my opinion is that he went into this thinking, thinking that he knew a few things. Number one, that the United States was not going to get involved, or NATO was not going to get involved militarily. Correct. That the sanctions will not be serious and, and hold. This is what he, in, in his mind. Yeah. I think he was and, correct and then incorrect. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, I mean, and, well, that, that's, that's really, that's, that's basically it. That, and that the, uh, and that he would have an easy time of the Ukraine army and the airspace. He, he thought he knew the, all those things and he was wrong about all those things, but, or two, two out of the three of those things. But if he had, if he had known, if he had, if the, if the answers had been the opposite, if he had known or felt he knew that the United States and NATO were going to fight us, the sanctions will be very serious, including uh, my, my entire energy industry. And Ukraine is not going to be as e very easy to, to take. Would he still have done it then? I think so. So that's the thing that's that rational. I've Right. This is where I'm more concerned. I kind of, that's what I was trying to do with that tweet thread is like, we're approaching this, like the Cold War paradigm, us versus them kind of thing. I don't, I don't think that's what's going on. Uh, you can see there's a lot of pushback inside Russia by old Soviet hands. They were like really anti-US, but are like, we should not do this. That's pretty significant. They also, to deceive us, they deceived their own soldiers in Belarus. They bought them round trip tickets told them they were coming back the day after the invasion <laughs> they, they went in the day before they were like we're going to kiev that's why you saw in the north in particular soldiers that were detained were like i thought i was going home they weren't lying they, they thought they were going home they weren't committed to the fight they never thought they'd be in an invasion force and they got chewed up then now the south is a different story that's their better military units down there and they're they're rolling i, I they're not doing awesome but pretty good you know from their perspective so, my fear, my fear, I think, Noam, which I, I would echo what you're saying, is, is that he he can't lose. He's never lost a war. He cannot lose. He wants his place in history. And what I'm more worried about is what he will do regardless of what we do. Like, he is set on something. I don't think we totally understand it. I, I am in the position, like, I don't know what he is, what he will go to, what lengths he will go to, or, or when it would stop. That, that's That's why... I felt that we needed to be, even to the extent of bluffing, that we needed to be much stronger at the top of this, not tell yeah. him, because the psychology, you don't have to be Freud to understand this, that he, he, he can't lose now. He, yep. he could have backed off 
when he was still saying, I have no intentions of invading. So if we had made it look really daunting, he would have found some, some rationale and, and, or we could have thrown him some kind of bone and he, you know, and, and he wouldn't have had to invade and he wouldn't have been humiliated. He might have even had something to show for it that he could now. Or he, yeah, or he could have just taken Donbass, by the way, which is what yeah. he used as like his excuse to do this. He could have just done that. And I think everyone would have been like, we kind of right. thought you were going to do I, that anyway. There's one thing I don't know. Russia is one of the top militaries in the world. Why they cannot invade Ukraine? Um, they underestimated the Ukrainian military. Um, the second part is they are not good at logistics. So the one thing that makes the American military superior to all other militaries is we can move any unit around the world in 24 to 48 hours, drop them on the ground, and they start rolling. And we can re resupply them after they take off. That is unheard of in the rest of the world. No one can do that. And so the Russians in Georgia struggle with logistics, which is why they stopped. And here, it is a shit show in the north. Now, in the south, they're gonna do, they're doing pretty well. And that's the units that took Crimea. They're more professional and they're rolling and they're going to take the port, probably Odessa. When they do that, they can bring in supplies by sea and that, that's a game changer. Now, um, how, do, how, do we, how do we fit the puzzle pieces together of, of a particular worldview? So, so if he was always going to do this, why didn't he do it while Trump was president when he could have presumed that I mean, the, the, the story was that Trump was sympathetic to him. Why would he choose to do it under the president who was a little bit of an unknown how he would react? He thought Trump would give him part for free and without a fight. And that's why going all the way back to when Manafort showed up as a campaign manager from Ukraine, and he's working with Kalimnik, who's a GRU agent. And then the the literally the the Republican platform, which seems now to like totally make sense, was don't give Ukraine weapons. We won't support them. And a lot of Republicans are like, what the hell is this? This like came out of nowhere, right? That was part of the plan, which was like, Trump seems to get along with me. And Trump even came out several times. He's like, well, it seems like there's a lot of Russians there. So maybe it is Russia. And he said that verbally. So I think in Russia's mind, they're like, we'll take what Trump will give us. And then we'll, we'll move the checker, you know, the chess piece up. We'll keep moving it forward. I think they thought because the Biden administration is Obama 3.0, same national security staff that they would react the same because they were doing everything to get out of Iraq and Afghanistan. I think that was a signal we sometimes forget is if you're Russian, you see the U.S. pulling out of Afghanistan, pulling out of Iraq, pulling out of these places, talking about domestic issues. You're like, they're definitely not going to do anything this time. So are you saying that he would be less certain about Trump rolling over than he felt about, about Biden after seeing Afghanistan? Yeah, I think he just saw that the U.S. was pulling back everywhere. And the Biden administration did not have a good pullout of Afghanistan. And so I think he was like, these guys, they're not going to put up a fight. And, you know, if work with Trump, he might give it to me. Trump leaves, pressure. And if you remember last April, May, they did a big military exercise. That was all a stunt to see how we would react a little bit. And we reacted soft. Like we didn't, we didn't really like go crazy. We got really nervous and we, you know, ran a bunch of diplomats around, but we didn't send in force. We didn't send in troops. Like if we had deployed then, he might have been like, okay, these guys are serious. They're not going to do it. So the signals we sent were just like non-signals. And he was like, they're not going to do anything. What, what does he want from Ukraine exactly? Does he want the whole country or certain parts of the country that he wants to control? Besides so, the history point. Yeah. What is important to him? He wants to stand in Kiev in front of that building with the golden okay. top and be like, I've returned it to Russia. Like okay. it, Russian people are under me. And then in the, in the Eastern part of the country, there actually through telegram, a couple other places was leaked what they see to be the plan. And I think it's true. Of course, these things you can never know, but it does look pretty accurate, which was divide Ukraine East, West, almost like East, West Germany, and then control the East, have a puppet government, you know, that's pro-Russian in Kiev, and then slowly just let, you know, the West bleed out and become almost like Russia, you know, just a, a totally dismantled state because they wouldn't have access to the sea. You know, they'd be so cut off. They'd have to, everything would have to come in through Poland. They, they would die. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. He want access to the sea. That's one of the major things, right? Okay. Yeah. And what the wheat about, fields. The, uh, the wheat the crop is huge uh, there in Ukraine. Okay. Do, do, you, do you know the story? Because I can't seem to find it. You know, people like John Mearsheimer, is that, a, is that how you say his name? Yeah. Um, 
have have written that we were involved in the the coup uh, to get uh, uh, what's his name Yanukovych is that his name <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, um, to get the maiden coup and I have not been able to find any evidence that we were actually involved in this beyond this phone call where they discussed who would replace certain officials you know that uh, whatever her name was um, is there any truth to us being involved in that no I mean, here's the funny thing I heard another guy on one of those uh, kind of right wing you know podcast and i'd, I'd listen because i want to bring them like the cia back coup i'm like you know what the cia was doing then we were losing t- tens and twenties of people out in afghanistan we were in iraq like we we were so distracted i think when a uprising like that naturally happens i'm sure like the cia is like we got to figure out what this uprising is and what's going on then we orchestrated it. i it seems so far-fetched to me just knowing how these organizations work like the intel agencies well, people are saying this but i haven't been able to find a single fact I, i've seen no evidence of it and Zero. look i would imagine 100 percent guessing i don't know this is a fact i'm not in the cia but i can tell you right now if I was a CIA case officer stationed in Ukraine and I see a populist movement overthrowing the president, guess what my job would be? Find out what the hell's going on down there and who these people are, right? Like you would definitely be like, hey, who are you? What are you doing? Uh, what do you think this, you're an intelligence collector. That is what you do. Like the whole point is the US knows what the hell's going on in the ground. What I hear of the, a lot of the CIA stuff is this like, kind of like cold war sort of stuff that we're instigating these rebellions and like overthrowing all these countries like man how can we be so incompetent as a government and then so competent subsurface to do all of the actions of the world right like that's always what falls on these guys like i hear in tucker carlson talks we're wildly incompetent and so stupid in afghanistan but we secretly control the world as well it's like okay it's one or the other you know it doesn't make any sense He's uh, indefensible. So, so then, so again, so, so then also, so putting this all together, does your v- logic then imply that we should have moved to take Ukraine into NATO, uh, fast track it in some way? Well, this, here's is the, the wor- this is the worst of all outcomes. They're not in NATO, but they are going to get. Yeah, involved. we're in a danger, super dangerous middle space right now. And I, that's what I was trying to express in the tweet thread is like, we're going to watch it live, the destruction of Ukraine. Or we're going to get involved and we might trigger up, you know, escalate a war. How do we feel about this? Like, everyone's like, yeah, go to Ukraine. I'm like, do you know what a siege of Kiev is going to look like in week week four, week five? Like, it's going to be insane. So I, th- I think it's this. What's weird about NATO, and I <laughs> this is again the Tucker Carlson, like, I was on one day and I heard his show. And I Like, my head is almost exploding. NATO was put in place to stop people from invading countries in nato that's why it's a collective security arrangement and so like the baltics for example tiny countries could be taken by a russian military in hours right they were like we don't want to be invaded and we want to be a democracy estonia latvia lithuania can we be in nato and we said sure you know attack on one attack on all montenegro was the other one that's the whole point so then comes ukraine and both the eu is debating this issue you know nato is debating this issue and ukraine rightfully says Hey, how about NATO? We don't want to get invaded by Russia. And we say, no, you know, we don't want to trigger something with Russia. And Russia says, let's invade. (laughs) So the other thing about Ukraine is they gave up their nukes because of us, the U.S. and Russia. And so they are only being invaded right now because they went along with what we took as denuclearization. And yet we didn't put them in our treaty. So now they are undefended. It, it, and By we're the doing way, the, the middle ground, which is super frustrating. And interrupt yeah. you for a second, because one of the, the, the really bankrupt things about the right wing take on all this, and I'm sympathetic to, to the argument that maybe we should have been smarter about our, our Ukraine policy. Mm-hmm. But they, they talk so much about this Baker offhand comment that NATO won't go one inch east of East Germany. And maybe he did and maybe he shouldn't have said that. But they never mentioned but that way later Russia signed an agreement guaranteeing yes. Ukraine's safety. And that certainly supersedes anything that came prior. Whatever your complaints were, they're done once you sign the new agreement. It's it's just a it's a it's an untenable intellectually dishonest position to point out something that was said that has no force of law whatsoever yeah. and then pretend they didn't sign a treaty yeah it's ridiculous uh, david Sachs, uh, you know one of those really wealthy guys they got a podcast or whatever he was re- he's like a tucker 
he taxed a Tucker, wherever he says he was repeating this stuff too. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like we could not have ignored Russia more for two decades than we did. And in Syria, there was always talk about like, can we come to some sort of settlement, peace settlement with the Russians in Syria, right? Like we had coordination centers set up. So it's just insane to me if you know any of like on the ground stuff and how the U.S. military sort of went through these issues and the war on terror where we basically were like going into Uzbekistan to launch, you know, uh, logistics into Afghanistan. These I things. have, um, but, as one was that, but the flip side of that is that we really weren't smart. And I think I brought this up to you um, four, four years ago. We had these sanctions against Crimea, which didn't really bite. We were villainizing the Russians. Crimea was always Russian. They were never, ever, ever going to give it back. And I remember saying at the time, sanctions until Crimea leaves Russia, until Russia leaves Crimea, are sanctions till the end of time. And yes. that's dangerous for the world. And we had no, no um, strategy of how we were going to get out from under these sanctions. I mean, Trump made noises about wanting to make some sort of grand deal, which I would have been fine with, but he really was precluded from doing that because the left would have immediately accused him of being a Russian stooge. It was no way all the people saying these things now about Russia how he, and, and, and the war would have said exactly the opposite if Trump had been wanting to make peace with Russia. They would have been all military. There's one other variable, though, yeah. which was Tillerson. People forget. Part of the reason they brought Tillerson in is he's received awards from Putin. He was known as the oil and gas guy who could understand these relationships with oligarchs and could do that sort of thing. And Tillerson, you know, and Mattis and those folks, I think they maybe could have done that. And they, they lasted about six months. They were gone, right? So I think the biggest problem in the U.S. is we flip-flop now, like national security-wise, every four years, and we are never consistent. So I even if I was someone negotiating with the U.S., I would be like, I don't know that I want to negotiate with the U.S. Their position changes so violently every three or four years. I have uh, two quick there, questions. There, so I'll, I'll let you, there, but there is something slightly dishonest going on now where the same people who feel that we should have handled this thing with Ukraine less provocatively with Russia are the same people who would have screamed bloody murder if Trump had tried to make a deal with the Russians. And that, that really... Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead, Hatsum. I'm sorry. Um, first, do you see any scenario... Well nuclear weapon will be used at all and second uh what do you think of uh Putin demands to stop the war if yeah, they actually I, met this these demands would he stop and is it is it logical demands yeah that was my scenario at the end of the op-ed which is nato does not do anything putin still loses he's under pressure at home and faces basically a coup or a revolution or a complete economic collapse he's got to end ukraine short range tactical nuke in a small location. I mean, we have these visions of the day after tomorrow, like intercontinental ballistic missiles. That's not all nuclear weapons are that way. I'm not trying to minimize them, but a short range, small nuke on a place of lesser significance. I think we need to weigh what that is and how we would try and diffuse it. I, we've never really had a scenario like that that I'm aware of where somebody is so crippled and hobbled and can't win that to bring the West to the negotiate table, Ukraine to its knees, do it, you know, end it right now. Um, and it seems far-fetched today. Give it a month. You know, we'll see how the pressure builds. Um, and I also, it's funny, gosh, some of the nuclear experts were talking about when you go to a non-stable world, not bipolar, not, you know, unipolar, when you go to this multipolar world and everyone's got nukes, uh, the decision cycle of, of leaders who want to stay in control changes, in my opinion. And we don't really, we, we don't know what Putin's thinking. I don't think Russian leaders know or Russian people know what Putin's thinking. So that I find particularly scary, um, far more scary than like Iran. Iran, we know what Iran's thinking. They're pretty clear. They say when they're going to, you know, they put up lines or whatever. Um, we don't have mutually assured destruction with Russia right now. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I think it's possible, you know, and I've never had that moment in my life where I've sat around and been like, this seems not only conceivable, but like a scenario that could play out, you know, over time. Well, yeah, I mean, the theory of mutual assured destruction it was not super tight as game theory because mm -mm. The, the response, the person who has to make a response says, well, I've taken this hit. I can't undo that. Am I going to now? And we're the same ones, right? Are we now just going to just feel forced to end the world? 
We might not. Right. We might let the first bomb go. Yeah. And so that could be, you know, the way they think about it. Remember, we didn't bomb Tokyo, right? When we used atomic weapons, we picked a smaller city to send a signal, you know, to try and end a conflict. Yeah. That seems like kind of similar to the scenario we're in right now, where I feel like pretty nervous uh, for the first time, at least in my life, that this seems more serious. I feel like people are under, are, you know, if you go into the Twitterverse, everyone ever had a nuclear deterrence uh, class in college is now suddenly an expert. And they're like, oh, we'll do this. You know, if we do this, we'll do I'm like, mm, I don't think so. I don't think we've really ever thought this through that much. Yeah, I mean, and, and there's nothing, I mean, every, one of the things that bothers me, this is across the board in politics, that people are so sh sure of things, but really they have a certain, they're really talking in probabilities. Mm -hmm. We think I'm 90% sure he would do this. Are you going to take 10% risk of, of with the future of the planet, you know, or 99% yeah. sure? Uh, the, the New York Times had uh, Hillary Clinton at 99% sure of yes. winning the election. You're going to take a 99% bet on with nuclear weapons that he'll, that he'll back down. I mean, it's like, I could talk a good game about thinking we should have flooded the zone in Ukraine and we should have done everything to in, intimidate him. And I, and I believe that would be the right policy. I believed it at the time, but it's easy for me to say because I'm, I'm playing with the entire planet earth. Yeah. And, Clint, yeah. You, you, you let us know whenever you need to go. I need, I know you have a schedule, so you let no, me. Yeah, I think you had another question. I'm good. I'll, I'll just drive faster. Yeah. I'll give you, I got three or four more minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, Last question. Um, yeah. Well, what about Israel? Is a, <laughs> <laughs> no, if, if there is a scenario about, you know, possibility of nuclear uh, use, not in our soil, but in somewhere, shouldn't we like a real leader would step in now to stop this from actually happening? So uh, the Israeli prime minister, I believe today, what's his name? Bennett, I think, Bennett. Went, to, went to Moscow. Highly unusual, but I'm not all against that because they're much smarter negotiators than Macron running around, made look silly every week, calling Putin for 90 minutes and all this bullshit. So, yeah, but I actually think the answer is oligarchs, to be honest. The, the most significant bridges that understand Putin and understand the West are oligarchs. Russian oligarchs. And they're as Western oftentimes as they are Russian. You know, they've lived over here. They've lived in the UK. They lived in the West. I've bumped into them on occasion, right? And so they're as shocked, some of them. Others are not so shocked, but not happy about it. I think our, it, this is a weird time where I'm more interested in what American and Western business leaders who work with Russian oligarchs think about what's going on and that relationship. I don't, Russians. I wouldn't waste a minute doing diplomacy. We did that for a month before the invasion. We just look silly, right? Like he, he's, he knew what he wanted to do. So I think there are some options there that are non-traditional that we should explore. It was, was, um, uh, Lindsey Graham. Yeah. Ridiculous or correct when he said he hoped somebody would take Putin out. You keep that on the inside, <laughs> you know, because if Putin's going to use that against you as a justification, one for dis disinformation at home. Look at what they're saying about me. Okay. Right. That's an automatic playbook. And two, it confirms all narratives about the West and we can't come to the negotiating table. But three, he probably, things have gotten really unstable and we probably, it's been 22 years. And by the way, there's unconfirmed rumors in the last year about Putin being sick. So maybe that's why he's on this quest. His yeah. spot in history may only have a two-year time horizon. We don't know. But what if that's correct? Like, what if he is ill or he knows something's out there or he did have uh, some sort of issue because his setup is weird, even with his own staff. He puts them way across the room. That's unusual for him. He's usually the macho guy out front. If that is true, we should be thinking about and like- some recording goes with the same suit. They yeah, say, yeah. So it's been recorded why, a couple of times before. Why did he pre-tape pre everything? Yeah. What if he couldn't get it done live? Yeah, you know, like I would, people are like, oh, they pre taped it because disinfo or whatever is like, maybe they needed a few takes to make sure that it went right. And then he didn't want to screw it up. I, I, I just think there's so many things we don't know. I guess that's what I'm saying. I don't have all the answers. I'm just saying that when I hear the discussions about this is what we should do and this and that, I'm like, I think there's a lot of unknowns out there going on in Russia that no one really knows that we need to take into consideration. A crazy time. Clint, you should come down with, I, 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 I um, know some Russians who know a lot about this stuff. 
Um, I'd love, love I, to talk to him. Yeah, I, I get I could get them to come down. Um, I don't want to say on 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 the air, but I, I people that you would want to talk to. If you're should... free tomorrow, I'm going tomorrow. I'll text you anyway. <laughs> but, well, uh, we should we should go to the comedy cellar and negotiate this the de-escalation in russia which would be a great story well the ukrainian is a Canadian <laughs> president right well yeah. if you why if not you, why not it, it all fits the script well, writes itself. that's actually funny how that's how it started with many first debate ever clint I, uh, thank you I, so I much for your time and if you hey, uh thanks uh, for if having you me guys wanna follow you just uh, go to his twitter clint watts right uh, uh selected wisdom is a selected twitter wisdom. Okay. old blog yeah Excellent. all right thank you so much See you soon i hope clint See yes you soon. we'll do it soon